So there are essentially two places a pathogen can live when infecting a person. A pathogen can either live intracellularly within cells or a pathogen can live extracellularly within the interstitial space or in the blood plasma. So if a pathogen lives intracellularly, it's our cytotoxic T cells that take care of them. However, if a pathogen lives extracellularly, it's our B cells that take care of them. So in this video, I want to talk about B cells. So we could have lots of different potential pathogens. And we know each of these pathogens have their own unique proteins, carbohydrates, and lipids. So sometimes we refer to as these unique molecules as antigens, but the point is each unique pathogen is going to have its own unique antigen with its own unique shape. So something important to realize is we have these really important immune stem cells in our bone marrow, referred to as hematopoietic stem cells. But essentially what these stem cells can do is divide to create these B cell progenitors. And something important to realize is every single cell in your body has the exact same genome. We know we get genes from dad and we get genes from mom. So each of these cells have the exact same genome. And there's a region of this genome that encodes an antibody. So we have this antibody gene that encodes an antibody. However, each of these B cell progenitors can go through a very interesting process referred to as VDJ recombination. So when this B cell goes through VDJ recombination, essentially what it's doing is it's taking this antibody gene and it's shuffling up these base pairs. It's scrambling up these base pairs in a very random process where it's scrambling up these base pairs, yielding a brand new unique antibody gene. So each of these B cells take the antibody gene and it scrambles up these base pairs to create a very unique antibody gene. So therefore, each of these B cells is going to have their own unique antibody gene. So therefore, they're going to express these antibodies and each B cell is going to have its own unique antibody with its own unique shape. And something really interesting is essentially based on how large this antibody gene and the way this VDJ recombination works, there are essentially 10 trillion potential different antibodies. So here I drew five different potential antibodies. However, there are trillion different combinations with trillions of different antibodies with their own unique shapes. So therefore, we know these pathogens have their own unique antigens with their own unique shapes. So let's say we're infected with this, this pathogen, with its own unique antigen, with its own unique shape. Just by chance, it's most likely that we're going to have a B cell that just by chance happens to have an antibody that perfectly fits and binds to this antigen. For example, we know we're going to have trillions of different B cells with their own unique antibodies. So let's just say this particular antibody happens to perfectly fit this antigen. So what's going to happen when this antibody fits and binds to this antigen? Well, again, we're going to have our B cell. So we have this unique B cell with its unique antibody gene expressing these unique antibodies. So it's going to express these antibodies on the plasma membrane. So just by chance, we're going to have a B cell that perfectly binds to this antigen. So what happens once it binds to, to this antigen on this pathogen? Well, then it's going to endocytosize the pathogen. Then it's going to essentially chop up this pathogen. So it's going to chop it up. And once it chops it up, then it's going to take this antigen, this unique antigen, and present it on the cell. So when it presents it on the plasma membrane, it presents this unique antigen on this MHC2 complex. So the point is, we have a unique, a unique B cell with a unique antibody, it binds its pathogen, then it presents that antigen on its surface through this MHC2 complex. So why is it doing this? Well, to understand that, first we need to understand we also have these antigen presenting cells. And the most common one is dendritic cells, but essentially these dendritic cells they essentially phagocytosize these, these pathogens. So they're in a, in a very unspecific way. They, they phagocytosize these, these pathogens. So when it phagocytosizes the pathogen, it also chops it up. It also chops up the pathogen and presents it, presents that antigen on this MHC2 complex. So they're both doing similar things. Remember, this B cell has a unique antibody that will uniquely bind a pathogen and express it, while these antigen-presenting cells are gobbling up everything they come along and then presenting those antigens. But eventually, it's going to gobble up uh, this, that specific pathogen and present that unique antigen. 
So now we have this antigen presenting cell and this B cell presenting these antigens on this MHC2 complexes. So remember those hematopoietic stem cells, those immune stem cells, they're also dividing to create helper T cells. So again, all cells in the body have the same genomes. And part of this genome encodes a T cell receptor. So let's say this part of the genome encodes a T cell receptor. However, these helper T cells also go through that interesting process where they essentially scramble up these base pairs to create a, its own unique T cell receptor. So each of these helper T cells are gonna have their own unique T cell receptors. Cause again, they take the T cell gene, scramble up those base pairs to create a unique T cell receptor. So then they're gonna express those T cell receptors. So each of these helper T cells have their own unique T cell receptors with their own unique shapes. So just by chance, we're gonna have a helper T cell that happens to have a T cell receptor that perfectly binds this antigen. So what's going on? I know there's a lot going on, a lot of different processes going on. So what's what's going on? So let's put it all together. So again, we have this B cell with its unique antibody gene expressing these unique antibodies. So eventually it's gonna bind a pathogen that happens to have an antigen that perfectly binds this, this antibody. So depending on what this antigen is determines what occurs next. For example, if this antigen, if this antigen happens to be nucleic acids or lipopolysaccharides or glycolipids or carbohydrates or some kind of repeating unit, then immediately this B cell will essentially endocytosize this, this pathogen and then, and then it'll essentially multiply and differentiate into creating lots of these B cells with these particular antibodies and then it's going to start secreting those antibodies to attack these pathogens. So this is a pretty straightforward process. This B cell with its unique antibody, if it happens to bind an antigen, and if the antigen happens to be one of these guys, then it'll immediately start secreting these antibodies to attack these pathogens. However, if this antigen happened to be a peptide, and normally these antigens will be peptides, so if this antigen happens to be a peptide, then instead what it does is it endocytosizes, and then remember what it does is it expresses that antigen on this MHC2 complex. So then it's gonna express that antigen on this MHC2 complex. And the reason why it's taking this antigen and expressing it on this MHC2 complex is it's asking the rest of the immune system. It's wondering, should I produce antibodies against this antigen? Because remember, this B cell got a match. It bounded to an antigen, so it got a match. So once it matched and bounded to an antigen, now the B cell is wondering, should I produce antibodies against this particular antigen? So how does this B cell know if it should start to produce antibodies against this particular antigen? Well, we also have these antigen presenting cells, which are normally dendritic cells that are phagocytosizing these, these pathogens and expressing those, those antigens on these MHC2 complexes. So again, we're gonna have lots of different types of helper T cells with their own unique T cell receptors. And just by chance, we're gonna have a helper T cell with a T cell receptor that perfectly binds. So once we have that one helper T cell receptor that perfectly binds, then once it binds, and something important to realize is, yeah, the, we have these different T cell receptors that bind the antigens, but we also have these CD8, CD4 positive receptors that help latch onto this MHC2 complex. And sometimes these helper T cells are referred to as CD4 positive T cells. But, but just, just something to realize, so sometimes you'll see these as CD4 positive T cells. But essentially what happens is they bind this T cell, this unique helper T cell with its unique T cell receptor happens to bind, it, it has a match. Then once it matches, it, 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 it knows, once it binds, now this helper T cell knows we must be infected with this particular antigen. That, that's why, or, or else this antigen presenting cell wouldn't be expressing, the, or it wouldn't be showing this, this antigen. So therefore, when this helper T cell binds to, to this, this antigen, now the helper T cell knows we must be infected by, with this particular antigen, with this particular shape. So now that the helper T cell knows we must be infected with this particular antigen, essentially it starts to differentiate. And when it differentiates, it, it forms similar copies of, of this T cell with this T cell receptor. And it divides into two lineages, these memory T cells 
and these effector T-cells. So these memory T-cells just hang around. So these memory T-cells just hang around for future infections. So if we get infected with this particular antigen in the future, we have this army prepared to handle it. But we also divide to form these effector T-cells. So essentially what these effector T-cells do is they bind to this B-cell. So this effector T-cell binds to this B-cell. And once it binds to this B-cell, now it tells the B-cell, yes, you should produce antibodies against this antigen. This effector uh, helper T-cell is essentially, it's confirming that we are infected by this antigen. Because that's why it's, it went through this process, because it knows we are infected with this antigen. So it's essentially now it's telling the B-cell, yes, you should produce antibodies. So then the B-cell starts producing these antibodies to attack these pathogens. So therefore, notice, for this B-cell to go through this process, when it runs into one of these peptides, it needs two signals. It needs this signal where the B-cell binds, but it also needs the second signal where this helper T-cell essentially also binds to this antigen, confirming that, yes, we are infected with this antigen, so we should go through the process of, of secreting these antibodies. So why does this B-cell need these two signals? Well, this B-cell isn't going to just secrete antibodies, it's also going to differentiate into these memory B cells, and it's also going to differentiate into these effector B cells, these plasma cells. So this requires a lot of energy, so therefore this B cell needs to be sure that, that we're infected with that antigen. That's why it needs those two signals before it goes through this process of forming these memory B cells and these plasma cells. So again, these memory B cells just hang around, so therefore if we ever get infected with the same antigen in the future, we have this army prepared to handle it. But we're also going to differentiate into these plasma cells. So essentially what these plasma cells do is they enter into the, the circulatory system and then they start releasing those antibodies. They'll essentially start releasing those antibodies to attack these, these, these pathogens. But what do these antibodies do? Well, what happens when we release these antibodies? Where they're going to eventually bind to these pathogens. So what happens when these antibodies bind to the pathogens? Well, there are three major things that can happen. First of all, we can neutralize the pathogen. So maybe this antigen, maybe this pink triangle, this antigen, maybe it was important. Maybe it was, it was important for, maybe this pathogen needs this antigen to maybe enter inside of the cell or to be, to be virulent. So maybe this virus or, or this pathogen needs this antigen. So therefore, if we have this antibody that binds and blocks it and, and is getting in the way, now this antigen can't function because it's blocked with this antibody. This antibody is blocking it. It's neutralizing this antigen. So now this pathogen can function. Also, what can happen is once this, this antibody binds, it essentially is tagging the pathogen. Now the pathogen is tagged with this antibody. So now we can have immune cells like macrophages that see hey, this pathogen is tagged, so therefore we should destroy it. We should phagocytosize it and we should destroy it. And something important to realize is I explained how these different antibodies have their own unique shapes, but it's a little more complex. Really, this is the real shape of an antibody and this is the region of the antibody that varies. But the point is, real antibodies, essentially they have two regions. They have a region that, that's variable, so they're all, all these antibodies are different with this variable region with their own unique shapes, but they also have a constant region. So all those 10 trillion different antibodies have the same constant region. So it's this constant region that this macrophage senses, and it sees this pathogen is, is tagged, so therefore we should destroy it. So also what can happen is once this pathogen is tagged with this antibody, essentially we can initiate the complement system. So in our bloodstream, we have a lot of these complement proteins and it's really complex. But the point is once this, this pathogen gets tagged with this antibody, we form this antigen antibody complex. So then these proteins, these complement proteins senses that and they initiate a cascade of events where they essentially form one of these membrane attack complexes. And essentially, these, these complement proteins form one of these membrane attacks complexes, which essentially forms a hole. It pokes a, pokes a hole in the pathogen. So now through osmo, osmotic effects, water flows in and then the pathogen bursts. And now the pathogen dies. But the point is, it's these B cells that take care of extracellular pathogens. If a pathogen lives extracellularly, it's these B cells with their antibodies that take care of them. And this is referred to as humoral immunity and the humoral immune response.